Welcome back again in our series on Fundamentals of the Faith. In this particular section of miscellaneous topics, we are discussing the second coming of Christ. Last time we covered the very short chapter of 2 Peter 3. This time we're going to cover two chapters, or parts of one and all of another. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. And then we're going to look over into the uh, book of Matthew and look through that complete chapter 24 and see some very great things. Now all of these, as you will now remember, are on the second coming of Christ. Again, we are not looking at this as you would in a uh, denominational doctrines or denominational dogmas course where we would take the false doctrine and hold it up and look at it and then come to the scripture and see what the scripture has to say. What we're doing in this case, in this situation, we're strictly looking at the scriptures to see what they say, to see what God says through his inspired writers. And then in the next session, the last one, what we will do is to take certain questions that would arise in our minds or anybody's mind if the premillennial theories are true. And so during that session, oh, 18, 19 questions, we will have regarding that theory, and then we will look right directly back into a scripture that gives an answer precisely to that point. And I think that you will come to the scriptural position then of the second coming of Christ. What it is, when it'll be, what will happen at the time, and that there is not going to be then a third return of our Lord. Only the one that he came the first time, and then the what we call the second coming of Christ. The first section that we want to look at is in the book of Second Thessalonians. And we want to look in chapter 1, and we want to look through the verses 7 through 10. All right, let us read these verses. He's talking about people giving the people of God trouble. And he says then to us, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. It's just a short passage, but it says many, many things to us about, of course, this second coming. The first thing is, nobody denies, he's coming. He is going to come back. And at the present time, where is Jesus? Well, he has gone on, the scripture tells us, to prepare a place for us. We see this in John chapter 14, the first few verses. He is now preparing a place for prepared people to spend eternity with him. And so we know that he's off there. He is doing that work for us to now while he is also an intercessor for us. Now, no one knows the day the time, the year of his return. We also see that in Matthew 24, 36. We also saw that over in 2 Peter chapter 3. No one knows when the Lord will return. And everyone will see him. Uh, Acts chapter 1, 9 through 11, we have the ascension of the Lord. In Revelation 1 7, we see that he is returning, and every eye shall see him as he left. And so we know then that it is going to be something that is visible, something that we can see, just like those at his ascension saw him leave, people on earth will see him then return. All right, so Jesus is going to return. 
Again, what are the actual happenings at the time of his return? Well, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians and in verse 16, we read this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. So he is going to descend from heaven. And he's going to descend with a shout and with a great voice, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. And so we see then that great things are going to happen when he returns. Uh, do you get the idea so far that this is not a secret return? That it's going to be every eye that sees and that there's every ear that can hear is going to hear? Do you get this idea? You should, because that is what the scripture is teaching us. In our previous study in 2 Peter chapter 3, specifically verse 12, we found that this earth will not be here anymore. When he returns, it is going to be destroyed. And then from 1 Corinthians, I want to read that passage also, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Here we read, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In verse 52, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this confirms what we've just read right here in 2 Thessalonians. We know now that he is going to return, he's going to return with a shout, and all of the dead are going to be raised. So the graves are going to be emptied. Everybody will be there at that time. This destroys a lot of the premillennial theory right there. And so we do know then that he is going to return. He's going to return with a great voice, a great shout. He's going to return, and the dead will be brought forth from their graves. What else is going to be? Well, we're going to have judgment. Judgment time is here. We read in Hebrews 9.27 that it is appointed once for men to die and then to the judgment. This is what is appointed to mankind. <clears throat> so now, how about those that are His? They will be glorified, we read right in these passages right here. And what about those then that do not believe, that do not obey? Well, they're going to be sent to everlasting punishment. We saw that right here in our Second Thessalonians passage, chapter 1, verse 9. So then we have to ask, what do we do? The answer is be prepared. Be prepared. Uh, life is too short. James tells us, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, he says life is, is like a vapor. And what is it? It's here and it's gone. It just seems to evaporate away. So we had better live righteously now. Isn't that also what Peter said to us? Yes. So the writers of the New Testament thoroughly agree on this subject and how we should be and how should we should be prepared at the time of his coming. Well, what is the conclusion of the whole thing? Let's look at verse 8 again in 2 Thessalonians 1. He's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and, catch that, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> What's the conclusion? Obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. Now, many of us have the idea that obeying the gospel is a one-time act that is the part of becoming uh, a Christian, the conversion process. Yes, that's part of it. But that is not just the gospel. The gospel is the whole New Testament. It is the good news from God, and it has commands, it has rules for us to obey after we're Christians. In fact, most of the New Testament is written that way, to give us guidelines in our Christian life. And obeying those, we also obey the gospel. So, what's the conclusion? Be prepared. Obey the gospel. That is the the conclusion. 
Now, as you read through and you looked at this, did you see any difference there in what uh, this Paul here is trying to tell us as, to what, as opposed to what Peter had told us over there? No difference. You saw no difference at all. They're telling us the same thing things and they fit together one may give us a little bit more information than the other but when you put them together they do not contradict they're not opposites they do match all right now we want to look at another section of scripture this is a rather long one really we want to go to matthew chapter 24 turn there with me if you will please 51 verses in this chapter but we will see that it is not as complicated perhaps as some have tried to make it out to be. Some have really taken this and as Peter said, they have twisted it. And he's talking there specifically of Paul's writings, but it's very true here of Matthew's writings. People taking these and taking them out of context, ignoring the rest of the scripture and coming up with strange, strange theories. All right, now as we look down at this, this is the destruction of Jerusalem and Christ's return. That's Matthew 24, the whole thing, verses 1 through 51. Now the thing that is, we have to be very concerned of here is that these men are asking our Savior a question. Actually, three questions. They're going to ask him three distinct questions questions. But our Lord is only going to give two answers, for he considers two of them really one question, and so he answers them together. He gives two answers, combining two questions and giving the answers to the two of them as one. So let's look into the scripture then. We're in Matthew 24. I want to read the very first three verses. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all of these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. That was a startling thought to these men to, to look at the temple. And so some questions come to their mind. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign, is the question, of the end of the age? So they've asked him three questions. Let's read them again. Tell us, when will these things be? the destruction of the temple, and of course in Jerusalem, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, or the end of the world. And then in verse 4 we see he's going to pick up the answer and start to tell them these things. So, what do we have again? We have three questions. The first one is, when is going to be the destruction of the temple and of really Jerusalem? The other two that the Lord considers as one is what is going to be the sign of your return, Lord, and what's going to be the sign of the end of the world? Jesus considers his return as the end of the world. That's a startling thing when you look at the premillennial theories that we have around us because they will not agree with this at all. But our Lord considered those two as the very same question, and we're going to see that in the way that he answers then the questions. The first question is answered in verses 4 through 28. And he's going to talk first of all about signs, beginning with verse 4 and going into verse 15. And we read, and I am taking the time to read. I think it's very important that we actually look down through the scriptures and read them. And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many th will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. 
See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginnings of sorrow. Now mind you, he's still answering what? The first question. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Remember now, we're talking about the destruction of the temple. We're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then that end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. All right, there's his answer to the very first question. They have asked that question again. What was it? When will this temple be destroyed? Well, we understand that also to be when will Jerusalem be destroyed. Uh, they'd have to destroy Jerusalem to be able to come in and destroy the temple. There's, they just would not allow that temple to be destroyed unless they also lost everything else, the city and all that went with it. So we have the signs then given to us by our Lord answering that first question in these verses. He said in verses 4 and 5 and also incidentally through 23 and up through 28, he says there are going to be many false Christs. He said there are going to be many false ones. Let's look at those verses 23 then through 28. But if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ or there, do not believe it. And see, he's already alluded to that in the other part here. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect, the saved. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will also be the coming of man be. For... Wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Let me give that last verse to you again. For wherever the carcass, that is Israel here, where it is, the eagles, that's the false Christ and false prophets, will be gathered together. And we see that so true back at that time. We can look back through the history of the time and see that that is exactly right. And we have secular history that verifies this. Uh, we can go back and look at Josephus' writings down through this. He lived through this. He documents it very, very well. And so we can look even into his history to see these things that are happening. So false Christs are coming. But the true Christ will also come one day. But do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by these people. They're going to say that here I am out in the desert, or here I am in an enclosed room, or here I am down at the temple, or here I am. Don't believe them. That just simply is not so. He says, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. Were there wars and rumors of wars before the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes. Yes, indeed there were, all through the area, plus right there itself. So this is all fulfilled prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. There are going to be natural calamities. Were there? Yes. Were these things afterwards? Yes. But they preceded what he is talking about right here. This did come to pass. And we have to get that very clear in our mind that this then is talking about 
when will the temple be destroyed? When will be the end of Jerusalem? So he says very clearly, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars, there's going to be natural calamities, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be earthquakes. All of these are going to happen. Sounds very natural, doesn't it? Yes, and it's very much the same there. He says that persecutions are going to come. And persecution, so much so, and, and the false prophets telling so many lies that they would even deceive the saved. Oh, yes, they're, they're deceiving those that are lost, and they are deceiving those who might have become Christians, but their arguments many times are going to be so convincing or their persecution is going to be so strong that it will even convince Christians, weaker Christians, to fall from the faith. And so we see clearly again that, that we have all of these predictions coming true as we look back through history. He says there is going to be an apostasy. That's, that's very clear in verses 10 through 13. He said they, we will even betray each other. Christians will betray each other. That's sad, isn't it? It's sad when you have to worry about the world. It's sad when you have to worry about those people out there and the things they do. But it's even worse when a brother or a sister falls and then causes you trouble as well. So sad when a brother or a sister uh, will cause uh, dissension within a congregation, will cause problems and split congregations. As you can see, that's nothing new. That's nothing new, friends. Our Lord has talked about it right here, and it was going to happen before 70 A.D., before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. He said all of this is going to happen. And, of course, we see a lot of it of doing more later. But the thing I want to really emphasize to you is that he did say this was going to happen. He's answering the first question, and it did happen. So all of these predictions came true. All of these signs of the end of, of Jerusalem, the end of the temple, did come true. We have to keep that very clearly in our mind. All right, moving on now. We're going to have the gospel preached to the whole world. Yes, to the whole world that those people knew anything about, everywhere they could, they went, they carried the gospel every place they could. They carried it in every direction of the compass. Those people went everywhere. The book of Acts says that they were scattered everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. Preaching and teaching the word. And so the gospel is preached. Did that happen before the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes, it did happen before. Again, you don't have to take my word for it. Go into history, go into uh, what we call ecclesiastical or church history written by uninspired people, or go and read documents from different countries, secular history. You will find out that it happened, that it really did happen happen, that the gospel was preached. Also compare this with Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. And then he says, <clears throat> look back now here at Daniel, even he talks about the abomination of desolation. And did that happen? Was the temple defiled? Was the holy place defiled? Was the holy of holies defiled? Yes, to all of them. Did this happen? Did these non-believers come in and do horrible things, mixing the blood of animals and people right there, uh, doing uh, abominable acts, uh, doing uh, torturous things and harmful, hurting, killing? Did all of that happen? Yes. Was the temple totally defiled at that time? Yes. There is not a Jew at that time that would have even considered that temple being available to worship for God at that point. Much work, much purification, much would have to be done to ever bring it back into condition where they knew it would be acceptable to God. 
Did it ever get brought back into that condition? No. It never did. It never did come back into that condition. Well then, <laughs> what are we to do? Again, we want to pick up the book and read. This time we want to read verse 15 again and then continue on through verse 22. He says at the end of verse 15, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the hilltop not come down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those with nursing babies in those days. Oh, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. All right. What to do then at the time? What to do when this temple is going to be destroyed? What to do when Jerusalem is going to be destroyed? He gives us our answer in these few short verses, the last part of verse 15 through 22. What should we do? Well, many things he gives us here. He says, now, if you're, if you're out in the mountains, flee. <laughs> Don't try to come back to the city. Now, remember, he's talking to Christians. He's saying, do not come back. If, if you're out there in the mountains, go. Th this, this town is going to be destroyed. This temple is going to be destroyed. Do not come back. Do not be destroyed with it. All right? Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. When you see this coming, when, when these armies arrive, and we know General Titus did arrive, and we know he brought his armies, and we know that he destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and the temple, and he tore down every block one from another so there wasn't one standing on top of each other. We know those things came to pass. And Jesus is saying, when you see this coming, go, get out. Don't wait. Get away from this place. Get totally away from this place. And what else? Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Poor mothers trying, trying to raise their children, trying to just to keep sustenance to them. He says, I feel sorry for them. But this is a time when you're going to have to pick up and leave. You can't cling to that house. You can't cling to your home. You can't cling to your property. You can't cling to your things. You cling to your life and your soul and those of your children and get out of there. And pray that it doesn't come at this time when it would be hard on you. And also pray that your flight will not be what? In the winter time. When it'll be rainy and cold out there in this area, which is what happens at this time of year. Pray that it's not then. That would make travel so difficult. And that it's not on the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath for the Christian has been removed as far as worship is concerned. But well, what difference does it make then, Lord? The Jews in that town that had not been converted still worshipped according to the Old Testament laws. And what did they do with the gates? They closed them on the Sabbath. They closed those gates. Nobody going out. Nobody coming in. And if this great army comes down and is going to close down around us and it's going to be on the Sabbath, we're in trouble, folks. Pray, he says. Pray that it will not come at that bad weather time. It won't come when you've got those little ones close to you like that. Pray that it will not be on the Sabbath that you'll be locked in and destroyed with the others. Pray that those things won't be. 
And then he says, there will be great tribulation. Oh, was there tribulation? Was there killing? Was there uh, uh, encampment around and uh, so that they could not escape? All of those things? Yes. And has that ever been there in Jerusalem like this before? No. Never before like this at Jerusalem, was it? And never again will be. Well, that's obviously true that it never will be again because that society was destroyed. That government was destroyed. All means of keeping that religion alive was destroyed. It's all gone. God did give his judgment against the way they had administered and followed his religion against the way they had administered and followed his government, the way they lived their lives. He put his judgment down against them. What was the way out? Christianity. Just as it is today, the only way out of these things is Christianity. And so he's talking to these, Christian, to these people that are going to be Christians and these that are going to then direct those that become Christians. And he says, remember these things. Teach these things and make these prayers. And then he makes this statement on verse 22. Unless those days will be shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect say, Christians, those days will be shortened. History tells us that some Christians were still entrapped within the city. All these things were happening. But for some reason, for a short period of time, the siege was lifted. And when that happened, the Christians had been educated and those that hadn't already fled from there left. We have no history in the Bible. We have no secular history to show that any Christians lost their lives. Why? The Lord warned them. They understood this. They understood what the Lord had told them. They saw these things. The predictions were accurate. They knew what to do and they did it. The end of Jerusalem was there. The end of the temple was there. The end of their government was there. The end of their society was there. All of these things are over. Well, <laughs> we move on now. Verses 19, 29 through 31, he's going to answer the second and third question together. What are we looking at now? We're looking at verses 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the sun will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now he's answering the second question and the third. Now the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his eagles with a great sound, his angels, that is, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. His most important thing that he was trying to get across to these people right now is that the immediate future was going to be the end of Jerusalem, the end of the temple. And he gave lots of room to that. But then he says, the end of time and my return are the same thing. And he gives us right here the things that are going to happen. He's, it's going to happen immediately. How? As God views it. Again, God is not going to break his promise. And we saw over in 2 Peter 3 that a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Time as we know it is not, does not register with God that way. Time is a creature of his, and he is going to keep his promises. So it's immediately then, as God views it, and it's going to be after A.D. 70. It's going to be in this age, but after A.D. 70. And the signs are the same. 
the Son of Man is going to return, and all things, the, the sound of the trumpet, and he will gather all of his saints from one end of the earth to the other. He will gather them together, and then they will be with him. There is the end of the earth. So, his return, the end of the earth. They're the same thing. So now he has answered the second and the third questions. Now, moving on. In the rest of the chapter, we have exhortations on how to be at that time, how to live, how to be at our time, how to live. He says to them at that time, know the seasons, you know them, therefore know the times that are coming. I've told you, I've told you what's going to happen before the destruction. You need to watch for it. When those things happen, flee, take care of yourselves. They did. He said that in this generation, in verses 34 and 35, those living, they saw the destruction of Jerusalem. It was going to come to pass. That was a very direct reference to them. Now, only God the Father knows when the end of time will be. We see that in verse 36. Therefore, be ready. I come as a thief in the night. It's going to happen. It's going to be a great surprise. It's going to be also like a master returning to his, his area after having a slave taking care of it. He says, don't be surprised. Don't get lax in your Christian duties. Don't get lax in your faith. Don't get lax in your worship. Study, study, study. Know God's Word. Be ready for the end of your life at any time. I've told you what to expect for the end of Jerusalem. As far as the end of time is concerned, it's when the Lord returns. But be ready. My friends, that was Matthew chapter 24. Next time when we come back, we're going to look into a great list of questions that we have for the premillennialists. Also, to review more study, compare with this chapter that we've just looked over with Mark 13 and Luke 21. See you next time.